Welcome back to the Minter Roulette Grind. This time, we're playing Reaper on a Friday evening. In this set, had a reasonably large amount of variants, covering both hard content and various different levels, without too much guild hest. With that said, for Duty 1, we go to World of Darkness as an instant replacement, and seemingly, we riffle through a handful of other replacements that don't want to be here. I counted at least three that immediately left before someone actually stayed. Hopping to the five-headed dragon then, we have yet another look at the strange knock-up mechanic. Last time I brought it up, I was told that it should work, and has been demonstrated years ago that being frozen should keep you safe. However, that aside, the suggestion was that maybe it only protects secondary targets. I'm not sure. In this case, we have a secondary target getting hit, but they got frozen possibly after the snapshot of the knock-up, so perhaps it doesn't count. This mechanic is really strange. On a more significant note, perhaps, I was Team B for Belly on Cerberus, so this might be a great time to have a quick overview of this fight. The sort of unexplained rule of Cerberus is that A takes ads, B goes in the belly, and C takes the chains, and also tanks the boss. Usually, it doesn't go even remotely as smoothly as this, though, but there is some logic to the distribution of tasks. A could use a tank to intercept the ads, the various plants that spawn, but a DPS can tank one plant, so as long as they're fought as they spawn, this shouldn't be a problem. B benefits greatly from bringing their tank in the belly to tank the adds that spawn in there, and so that leaves C, who ultimately only needs like two players total to deal with the chains, if even that. The way all of this is done is that of course A simply intercepts any plants that spawn, and C's tank takes Cerberus. When Cerberus gets a tummy ache from B's efforts, C sends two players to the spot near the exit gate that holds chains, and they each bring a chain to spots on Cerberus to chain the dog. Notably, the buff that indicates that you have the chains has a duration, so you can lose the chains if you grab them and just stand around with them for too long, which has wiped groups. B, however, has a somewhat more complex and counterintuitive task. To enter the belly, you must first be hit by this purple orb pulsing a mini effect that makes you tiny. Then you have to step into this purple goop, which Cerberus will then eat. If you are not mini when standing in this, you will die. Otherwise, you go inside. Once inside, you simply kill the stomach walls. Optimally, a tank picks up the unknown so everyone else can focus on the stomach walls safely, and once all are done, you can leave and will be forced out eventually too. Now, as I said, it rarely goes this smoothly. Case in point, our tank was not in the belly. They were tanking Cerberus, and no other tank came to help us either. We also didn't see the full B team in here either, but we managed. Often, it isn't even the C team that takes the chains, and sometimes A doesn't prioritize the adds. Sometimes no one really does, so the adds just run rampant. For Duty 2, we went to E12N against Eden's Promise. Quite funny with how I've recently seen a bunch of E4 and E8 as well. Not much of any of the earlier fights in any of the tiers. It also turned out Serana and Doki Doki knew me. Hello! A rather strange optimization about Reaper at level 80, or more precisely, before level 90, is that the enhanced void and cross reaping buffs are normally removed by using Communio, but without Communio, they carry over and out of Enshroud. The only notable effect this has on the rotation is that whenever you can re-enter in Shroud within 30 seconds of leaving it, you can effectively gain a free 60 potency from continuing the combo from where you left off. This isn't particularly impressive, but it does mean that if nothing else, you do get some free damage from stacking your Enshrouds together on top of Arcane Circle at this level. Actually stacking together your enshrouds is another story. Without plentiful harvest, it requires quite a lot of things to play out just right to be able to chain more than two enshrouds within close enough time to each other. Now, in regards to this fight in particular, a tip for the memory intermission here is that for the first one, two players will be marked as targets for cone AoEs. If you are one of those targets, wait with standing in the line we need to stack for to after the cones appear. That way, there is better space for everyone to stack. I think there's also a possibility the cones hurt the memory gauge. Relevant for specifically Reaper is also that I think it seems the mobs that are fought off here don't actually die, so Death's Design doesn't give any gauge for them, which is quite peculiar. Finally, during this final phase of the fight, the four center primals each indicate a different mechanic, obviously. 
Leviathan strikes the two sidelines outside of the center line. Garuda shoots out cone AOEs on the four cardinal directions. Ramu does a circle AOE that is just wide enough that if you stand at max melee range, you should be fine. Ifrit shoots out two wide cone AOEs, causing two thin cones of save spots lining up with the side arrows of the boss. I believe the only pairwise combination of these four that cannot happen is Ifrit and Garuda, since obviously that leads to an impossible to dodge scenario. For duty 3, we went to aside the leather pants, and the tank pulled the boss all the way out to the guild test NPC so we could exit faster. Well, I already have a special remedy to exit faster. Surprisingly, nothing much else happened here. For duty 4, we went to Earth's Fount, Odin, with a solid group. Reaper is quite strange to optimize at level 50. What you have to work with really is making the most of maintaining death's design when you don't have any raid buffs, if there are any raid buffs, and holding as much gauge as you can without letting any go to waste while waiting for buffs. Aside from that, it is just about 1-3 combos. In this specific group composition, the only raid buffs to watch for is battle voice, and perhaps making sure gauge is spent while a bard song is playing at all, although it is a very small game. Aside from this, the run went very well. For 2d5, we are an instant replacement in Castrum Meridianum. Apparently, Melf was left completely alone, which is wild. Although, I don't think this was their first run of this duty, so it isn't too bad. Still sucks that first-timers might have to deal with this too sometimes. Another minor optimization Reapers can do in duties at level 50 is that since you can only spend gauge on single target, but you can generate it with AoE, is to use Bloodstalk specifically on the healthiest mob to maintain maximum AoE as long as possible. Making sure all the mobs have death's design can also further help with this. That said, I wonder, would Reaper as a Pokemon just be straight up a dark type? Or would it be ghost dark type? Or would it include another type? What do you think? For duty 6, we have something's weird that initiates in the buckets. Hilariously, in this run, it felt like mobs died off so fast that it almost didn't make sense to start on AoE at all. Just single targeting each thing almost felt more effective. We also managed to kill things off fast enough that I didn't get pacified or anything either. Although, on the boss, I intentionally stood at max range to be on the safe side. For duty 7 and 8, we're doing some Dawn Trail raid bosses. Timestamp to skip if you want. That said, we start with M4N, Wicked Thunder. And I'm pretty sure this was the first time in Dawn Trail I really got to play Reaper past level 90, like really really, in a meaningful way, as most of my leveling simply didn't land me anywhere in Dawn Trail content. Overall, I think I did decently well, although there was one time where my 103 combo dropped, and rather than putting Gluttony at the end of a Dublin Trout, I consistently put it in the middle, which isn't optimal, as it ensures that the second Communio and Perfectio certainly won't fit inside raid buffs. Due to the timing at which we reached past 20% on Wicked Thunder, we got a past 10% before she even had time to start her final phase, which is an interesting detail about bosses that have phase changes based on HP. If they start on something just before the threshold, you might have a lot of time to push further. One tip that can be handy here as Reaper is that some of these unavoidable attacks, not to mention attacks that deal relatively survivable damage, are great opportunities to pop Arcane Crest. For duty 8, we were a 6 minute replacement in M1N, and we land straight in the middle of combat. Considering how early in the fight we are, the group either waited quite a while, or this is attempt 2. In this fight, I didn't do nearly as well with the 2 minute bursts, but then again, because I dropped in, in the middle, it would be difficult to align my burst with everyone else, although we really only have the Pictomancer for other raid buffs, I suppose. Regardless, this sort of led to me focusing more on just making the most of creatively weaving into bursts as best I could, instead of trying to optimize too hard. There was also a point where both tanks died, but it only took a moment for the group to recover, so it wasn't anything major. For duty 9, we went to the Great Hunt Extreme, Rathalos. This was definitely not my best performance. I have a tendency to forget Gibbet and Gallows in level ranges where Enshroud isn't available, which is a substantial loss. There were also a few times where I got slapped, leaving me moments from death. Despite all this, we had zero deaths. Stack Magas were mostly handled solo. We got the tail in the first down and Rathalos in the second, for a very efficient clear. It was a bit funny that very early in the first phase when I got hit, I ended up using a potion because I was unsure if our sage was going to do anything. Later, the red mage also helped me with 
some of the stack markers. Regardless, we managed to get through. And finally for duty 10, we have Shiva Extreme as a 1 minute replacement. Turns out Darian knew me and also said they were inspired to run men's roulettes from this series. Awesome! They also mentioned here at the start that they basically had run through the tactics of the fight and then people left, so here we go again. The main thing we discussed before the fight started was about the sword and shield, stack and bash, cleave. Also about making sure the tanks switch so they only take one type of damage. We also talked a bit about the bow phase and the knockback there, and maybe very briefly about positions for the staff, if at all. As we get started, I die during the ad phase because I end up focusing more on trying to explain to our Sprout tank where to face Shiva rather than just dodging out of the way. After the intermission, we also almost had a healer die to the first staff spreads. For the first bow, apparently, one of the tanks just took the bow cone. For some reason, I was so convinced that this attack does lethal damage to anything synced, but apparently not. Shortly after, I'm the one targeted by the knockback, and while I manage to step aside, I'm too slow to use my knockback immunity. The weird thing with this tactic is that moving Shiva all the way to the edge makes it possible to take the knockback without hitting the wall on the other side. However, often the other players don't see someone has the marker and so don't move out of the way, so sometimes it is safer to just step aside and use immunity instead. It is at least more effective when you press it fast enough. I got saved from the ice cube, but in the chaos one of the tanks died in a cube instead. We recover and survive the staff spreads, limit break goes out, and we round out the fight before more can go sideways. A surprisingly solid run. For DPS set, I have to say this was a lot of variety, although it was missing something rather specific. Zero regular dungeons? Like none at all? Nothing? Alright. Still helps round out the distribution a bit, I suppose. With that said, as I'm slowly approaching the end of the list of jobs, with my aim of doing one set with each job, I am curious what you think would be more interesting for mental roulettes after that. My initial thought would be to just run mental roulettes as the role in need, but given how regularly mental roulette is tank in need, that can get quite samey. Another way would also just be to choose jobs or roles somewhat at random for each set. There's of course also the option that I just go with whatever I feel like at any given time, that would mean that I have another way to dodge something like Guildhest spam by switching to the role the Guildhest spam is doing or something like that. Anyway, I'm curious if you have any ideas of how I could go about this as well. Please let me know in the comments. Now, that is all for this video. Thank you so much for watching. If you'd like to support me and my channel more directly, you can become a member like these wonderful people here. You can also alternatively support me through Ko-Fi, link in the description. You can also support the channel by letting the YouTube algorithm know by liking the video, leaving a comment, subscribing, sharing, and hitting the bell to get notified when next I post a video. Fun fact, when Reaper was initially added to the game back in Endwalker, Arcane Crest's healing aftershock was 100 cure potency per tick rather than 50. This change was done as the only balance change directly to Reaper in the patch that included the savage version of the first raid tier of Endwalker. In fact, Dancer's technical and standard finish were also changed in this patch to be weapon skills instead of abilities that worked like weapon skills, which helped with the plentiful harvest interaction, which could be considered a rather niche buff to Reaper.